call and then uh, the other when the other panelists come they can uh, join in at the same time am am i audible enough yeah yes okay yes. hello good afternoon everyone uh, let me introduce myself first i'll give a brief about myself so i am navin rai uh, professionally i am architect urban planner and uh, environment planner and like infrastructure planning at the same time i work uh, with the government of sikkim and i'm the chairman of urban planning and governance for the last 18 years 18 years so in the time uh, we must be ready to be you know moderating moderating this session having this your voice is dropping actually okay office mein aa office mein aa kaun se aapke office mein wait please uh, you okay, know स्मॉल रिक्वेस्ट टू एवरी वन सो आई वेन मिस लाइक आई रिक्वेस्ट एवरी वन टू म्यूट दे माइक सो दैट दी डिस्टर्बेंस इज लो एंड दी पर्सन हु इज स्पीकिंग कैन अनम्यूट दम सेल्फ द रेस्ट ऑफ देम कैन पुट अ म्यूट to their mics and anyway, you. Well, i'll 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 uh, you know uh, uh, we'll continue so i'm i'm very you know delighted to be moderating this session with uh, having this distinguished panel of uh, panelists uh, coming from different uh, backgrounds and and you know heading some of the cities as well as uh, as well as you know from the from the industry side So today we are going to have a session with uh, Mr. Anindo Roy, who is from the SAP SAP, and Vivek Ogra from uh, PwC Smart Mobility. I mean, uh, he seems to be uh, looking after the smart mobility on the PwC. Uh, Madam Iti Pandey, who is a chief commercial manager uh, from the Central Railway Government of India. and madam nikita paul secretary department of transport andaman and nikobar administration dr t arun ceo puducherry smart city limited development limited chetan nandani deputy commissioner transport and ceo smart city tn mr nodal officer moradabad municipal corporation and uh, engineer mobasi dan uh, with the ar ceo motor vehicle department government of jammu and kashmir so today's topic is basically uh, it looks like quite open so connected and integrated ecosystem to our smart cities whereby we'll be we should be focusing on the infrastructure transportation mobility and rate role of itms in smart cities so having said that as we we'll all know transport and mobility is the, is the crucial for the city to functions uh, and and it is also very important for a city to you know prioritize in in the sector where we need to make as to how we can make city faster and as the, or we can move city faster more efficiently and and more uh, provide more comfort to the citizens having said that so uh, there are many you know what we call i mean use case uh, on on the research as well as on the digital platform so there is no dearth of or shortage of the technology as i can see uh, having worked in storm work, having worked in this domain for last many years and i mean even from the inception of smart city mission and having engaged with lots of other other city outside the india so but coming back to the indian context so i hope that you know we'll be talking mostly about the indian context and the challenges what we are facing uh, in implementing these solutions or or even uh, using the solutions within our uh, organizations or uh, there are many uh, spectrum of challenges as well as uh, what do you call uh, we have got avenues or or scope where we can escalate or implement this kind of technologies as well as you know maybe maybe more, i'll i'll be more uh, interested to hear from the cities where they are focus or invested more on the mobility rather than transportation so uh, in order to begin with uh, i think i'd like to uh, invite mr anindo roy last from sap put forth with this uh, with this opinion and it uh, carry forward this discourse hello anindo 
Are you ready? Yes, yes. I hope you can hear me, Mr. Naveen. Yeah, I think um, you're audible to me. Uh, okay, great. Uh, so I'm just trying to share my screen because I just thought I'll keep two slides with me. Okay. Uh, so I thought I'll just use a few slides and I'll you know just share what is happening. Uh, quickly introduce myself again. Uh, I'm part of SAP and I'm part of the public sector IBU with a focus on mobility, future cities, smart cities, all these topics. And uh, it's a very exciting space to be in. And particularly urban mobility is uh, something that I've been you know, focusing on for the past now two years and there's so much happening. I thought uh, it will be great if I can share some of things that I have learned and also give you a perspective of what's happening. So it is really a big picture out there. Uh, there's a lot of money that we spend globally. Uh, the figure is $7 trillion. This is, uh, I think this is a, not the most updated figure, probably a year old, but still I thought I'll keep it there. And this does not include our air travel and our rail travel and everything. This is just the public transport globally. And there are so many players who are around this industry or around mobility. You have the OEMs like BMW, uh, Ford, Volkswagen, the newly vertically integrated players like Tesla. Uh, then you have these transport aggregators, Uber, Lyft, Grab. And of course, you have our uh, the unsung heroes so far, the passenger and rail and public transport uh, authorities. So really, the picture is big and everyone is trying to... Uh, what should I say, uh, do something uh, in order to make the mobility of a citizen within his city seamless, very comfortable, very nice, because those are the basic, uh, or what should I say, mobility is one of the basic things that a citizen requires. He requires a very comfortable way to reach from point A to point B and also have a return journey. What is really happening out there, when I said that there's a big picture, is there's something called as CASE. Everyone is talking about CASE. And CASE stands for Connected, Autonomous, Shared, and Electric. So uh, there are electric vehicles. I think most of the OEMs are now coming. Even in India, I see a lot of OEMs are coming out with their uh, uh, e-mobility projects. And the government also making the push of uh, procuring e-mobility. Shared mobility is really... Uh, improving day by day. Of course, I think with uh, the recent pandemic, a uh, little bit trends would have changed, but I'm sure once things uh, limp back to normal or race back to normal, things are going to be where we had left them. So shared mob mobility is seen as a very interesting concept. Uh, and by shared mobility, uh, it is not only the right sharing app, but also you sharing time of ownership of a car. We have connected mobility. Uh, this, this data was very interesting to me that more than 80% vehicles sold today have built-in connectivity. So the OEM can actually uh, monitor uh, how the how the machine is functioning. And of course, autonomous, there's a lot of money being pumped into uh, how autonomous mobility will look like and how it will function, how it will make the journey very uh, comfortable, very uh, safe, I would say. Uh, now, the real question is how do they make autonomous safe and how do they make it legal? So. Uh, I'm very excited to see what will happen. And where is all these? Where are these changes happening? Where are these taking place? They are mainly taking place in in three industries. One is the automotive industry. One is the cities, and in cities, I like to include uh, even the public transport authorities and everything. And of course, the utilities, because uh, people are saying the new age of transportation is going to be all electric. The uh, internal combustion engine is going to become obsolete, and the EV electric vehicle is become to become the new thing and the intersection point is there people are actually looking at the new uh, business opportunities over there what are the trends that are really impacting the cities you know what are the cities looking at first of all they are looking at supersonic mobility hyperloop the boring company uh, very interesting company by the way uh, then they are looking at seamless mobility within the city. They're talking about a single contact based start. They're talking about single bill for multiple model of transportation. They're looking at subscription based mobility. Uh, I think the government is also uh, coming down with regulations which will impact sustainability, banning IC vehicles to a certain extent where possible, ban on vehicles in villages, in city centers, uh, carbon neutral goals that cities are setting for themselves, uh, no car zones within the 
very very congested areas of the city uh, and you know uh, percentage of uh, recommended sales by an oem of ev vehicles so that uh, the uh, the oem doesn't uh, stop pushing the ev vehicle or the manufacturing the ev vehicle and of course there's this crazy stuff also happening the exciting stuff aerospace companies are talking about ev tall that is vertical takeoff or uh, landing which is going to be the concept of flying taxis and everything robot taxis and companies are actually working on that airbus boeing rolls royce austin martin gile all of them are there working on this it'll be interesting to see what happens but coming back to the city part what i really see will happen very quickly is today we have a card based ticketing system we purchase a card from the delhi metro uh, uh, you know card window uh, we top up some value on the card and that card becomes my permission to travel so i a uh, punch that card at turnstile gate or a flap gate it gives me permission to enter the uh, transportation hub and then once i've done my journey from point a to point b i tap out that card i add a similar uh, uh, hardware and i'm allowed to so uh, and accordingly money is deducted uh, what i see really happening is and what we are working with cities uh, at least two three cities we are doing a pilot today is account based ticketing now what is different in account based ticketing is uh your identity is what is your account and what is your card and what is your permission to travel so your identity becomes your permission to travel uh you tap in at an entry point you tap out at an exit point and all this is actually collected at a back end and the analytics about how much fare is to be charged is done at the back end rather than at the edge where it is happening today today when you tap out at the exit point of a metro that is where exactly the uh, money is deducted but uh, in account based ticketing it will be more it will be taken at the back end the system will be more what should i say agile it will be more uh, efficient in my opinion and once we have achieved account based ticketing largely let's say in metros and buses and everything uh, we will we, we will be in a position to offer citizens something called as mobility as a service and what exactly are my views of mobility as a service one is uh, you have your account based card you tap it and you pay a monthly bill of it or it could be something like netflix where you pay a monthly subscription fee and you are allowed to use as many modes of transport as many times as possible the cooler things that can happen is uh, the company is trying to promote uh, employees using public transport the public transportation company is tying up uh, giving in lot of new offers that if you travel to your office between 9 to 5 you will be charged 50% all of those encouragement to take those can happen of course that depends on how how the network uh, matures how the hardware matures and of course how the procurement system also matures um what could be the various ways uh, it could be an aggregator led system where in typically how you create the smart cities today you have an si creating this uh, infrastructure you could have the incumbent in, uh, uh, smart city vendor doing it for you or it could be actually what i'll be more interested to see and i hope that happens is the public transport authority actually takes up this project so something like the city metro rail corporation or the municipal corporation or a similar government body comes in and says that okay let me aggregate these various public transport systems as well as these uh, private transport systems and uh, give a service so let's see what happens i am uh, very interested i'm closely following this and what in sap we are trying to help as i told i we were working with a few uh, cities we are doing pilots and everything uh, is today if you look at and the above orange part is the traditional scenario that is happening today is uh, the customer if he or the citizen if he has to take multiple modes of transport as in he has to walk from his house to a bus stop or an auto stand Uh, or even probably cycle uh, then he has to get on the metro station then from the metro station to cover the last mile he has to probably again change his mode of transportation so there's various modes between the first mile and the last mile and the entire journey he has to purchase multiple tickets any delay or anything is on account of the citizen because there are all disintegrated systems uh, customer service is not best of the quality what we are really trying to help and work with our customers today are where everything is centralized in a in a probably a mobile app or something because mobile is the best way to penetrate uh, in the urban uh, bodies that we have or the urban uh, setups that we have also 
keep the same consistent quality of service that probably the citizen is very used to when he is buying stuff from amazon or he is booking a cab from uber or something like that and all the systems at the back end also are integrated in a manner so that the citizen gets some things like world class service and once the citizen gets world class service he is really encouraged to use public transport he is really encouraged to use this particular offering from the city so uh, that is what we are helping cities out with and of course you know uh, the mega dream or the mega uh, idea is that once you are applied this concept in an urban setup you actually can uh, recreate this concept once someone is traveling from one urban location to another urban location so right from uh, when you start your journey to catch a 6 o'clock flight in the morning from your house in delhi uh, do some work in bombay uh land in bombay whatever do your meetings and again come back to your house in delhi it can all be done in a very seamless process of course this will take a lot of time but i'm really interested to see how uh, mobility as a service comes into india and everything and uh, as i told you i think it is the most basic requirement of a city i'm happy to engage more in the discussion i won't take any more of the time thank you mr navin for uh, uh, for allowing me to speak and open the session uh thank you aninda for your for your insights about you know how sap is helping the cities and and the industry to to make urban uh, mobility very efficient now i like to call upon uh, vivek ogra to put forth his, his insights about this particular topic over to you uh, thank thank you navin ji a uh, very insightful presentation by anandov and uh, I, i completely agree uh, uh, with the kind of uh, uh changes that we are seeing in the transportation landscape in the cities uh and i i appreciate uh, the the sentence by navin ji saying rather than transport let's focus on mobility i think that's a very inclusive statement and that's what is required in the cities today uh so i come from the background of uh, transportation technology in cities uh and have uh, implemented uh, health uh, cities implement uh, Uh, several uh, uh, such systems for uh, different kind of uh, operating environments so my take is very simple that today uh, there are the two things which are very important and central to this transformation as far as uh, mobility in cities is concerned uh, it is accessibility and availability at the core of it now uh, when we are looking at uh, mobility as a transformation need rather than transport uh the first thing that one needs to do is uh, have citizen at the center of this transformation only then we will have a holistic uh, view of how cities have to trans- uh, transform to be able to provide uh, meaningful uh, mobility opportunities to everyone and anyone uh see what has happened in past is we have had a uh, thinking around uh, uh, vehicles and then the uh, travel lines were uh, decided this is how the buses are going to operate uh, there are routes which have been decided so people have to align their travel along these travel lines but today if we have to talk about mobility as uh, the transformative function for cities in many ways it is citizen who should uh, choose how to travel when to travel where to travel and that's where mobility as a service uh, plays a pivotal role not just in providing a uh, accessible uh, mobility uh, platform but also allowing people to travel more efficiently allowing everyone to travel with their choice and not by the choice thrown upon on them so with that uh, i think you know from the technology perspective there are several things that need to be looked at from the city perspective Uh, uh if you really look at uh, uh, what is city's objective uh, as far as public transport is concerned it is basically at the core of it is sustainability that environment uh, sustainability has to be there uh, we deliver uh, more with less uh, we should spend less on roads uh, more on quality of life all of this is interconnected and transport is in the middle of it so when we are doing a transformation as far as the mobility function is concerned in cities there are three things that are very important to look at one is the business function of the mobility second 
is the technology function that is going to drive and deliver business objectives with experience at the core of it because the unless and until we change the experience of uh, mobility uh, uh, we will not be able to uh, you know really reach uh, where we want to reach uh, in our cities uh, with respect to safety accessibility availability modal shift uh, why would somebody uh, move from a private mode to a public mode only when uh, it is accessible it's available it is safe to operate uh, and it is affordable very important in indian context we have uh, a diversified socio economic profile and hence transportation opportunities have to be built for everyone so we are uh, today uh, helping several cities in india uh, to really uh, transform holistic uh when it comes to holistic transformation it's not just about uh, the transport operators it's also equally important how well have we aligned pedestrian infrastructure how well are we aligning space for them because walking is part of the mobility infrastructure uh, how is uh, a walk mile connected uh, to the motorized and non motorized transport within the city uh, do we have a viable uh first mile last mile opportunity getting created in the cities and all of this uh will make sense when a technology drives uh, the accessibility part of it uh that's where uh, uh arando said that the mobility uh platforms mobile platforms are predominantly bringing a very different kind of opportunity now i would like to say you know while we're saying mobile platforms bring an opportunity it's also important to look at should we always say integrate 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 or should we create a common specification pool wherein people collaborate and hence an integration is an outcome uh, so so uh, uh, w- what i really mean to say is uh, there has to be a common specification basis of which different operators different services can interact with each other see today uh, we have got ncmc uh, being implemented in the country as part of a national common mobility uh, you know payment network or a payment uh, uh, system now the the genesis of the system is you have a ncmc uh, platform you can travel anywhere in the public transport in the country and that's a transformation that is required uh, from the digital perspective from the perspective of uh, people being able to pull up their own choices now when we look at that that is also a, a capability being developed to ensure that people are collaborating see the the moment that you are going to interop your payments collaboration is the next natural that's going to happen so i i believe technology has to play a very very pivotal role but it is very important to see how you apply technology in the context of the cities there's one common mistake that is uh, uh uh that uh, i mean we see that you know we apply one solution to every city every city has a different dna it has a different capacity to you know be able to deliver on those uh, requirements it has a different financial uh, capability and hence i think you know it's very important to look at city by its context and apply technology uh, as it uh, would deliver for that city that is one second is that uh, uh uh you need to look at uh, uh, what is going to be very important in future for example if we are uh, talking about electric uh, transformation happening in the cities uh so telemetry being uh, the central of this transformation because unless you understand uh, the operations environment around electric vehicle you will not be able to sweat the vehicle right because electric one of the most important thing is that your vehicle has to be operating on the road as much of time as possible and hence how do you harvest telemetry within your current context of itms in the cities how does a uh, uh, ice engine and electric uh, vehicle coexist and cooperate and deliver uh, meaningfully for the cities that's probably a very important discourse that has to happen in cities and uh, merely having an itms is not going to solve the uh, uh, solve the cities i think uh, i would end by saying accessibility availability and connectivity with uh, customer at the core of this transformation 
is the way to go in cities uh, and technology can play its role of delivering the promises that we make to our citizens. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Bibi. Uh, the key points uh, I'd like to highlight is, is more about accessibility, availability, and affordability, and the freedom of choice. And again, you have you're, you're connected this with the environmental sustainability, which is very, very important aspect at this moment. And, and another important aspect is walking, basically. So yes. what we've seen as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a, you know, uh, in the urban planner and, and the urban designer, so the walking needs to be very, very integrated in the mobility. Absolutely. And, 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 and the infrastructure needs to be you know, created within the, even I'm trying within my city, uh, under the smart city mission to create a uh, walking infrastructure, which is safe and integrated and well connected. And at the at the same time, uh, your take on applied technology in the local context is also so well uh, point well taken. Hope we'll have a meaningful discourse in 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 future. Now I'd like to uh, call upon uh, Madam Uti Pandey to put forth her uh, uh, insights about this. Thank you, Mr. Naveen. I would like to start my conversation by uh, quoting. Uh, uh, Vivek ji, who said that, you know, the citizen is the center of all kinds of developments which are taking place. And also the fact that the socioeconomic condition of that person who is coming to us as a major transporter, that is the first outlook that we should keep in mind. Having said that, we are talking about smart cities. But in the beginning, I just like to give you a feel of what railways is going through in the present circumstances in the COVID-19 times. So from the 1st of May till the 1st of July, we've run about, I'm talking of my central railway. If you take for Indian railways as a whole, 5,000 odd shramic specials carrying about 80 lakh all odd migrants from one part of the country to the other. If you come to Maharashtra, the number of trains comes to around 840. Out of it, 72%, around 600 has been done by the central railway, where I am right now the chief commercial manager for passenger services. And uh, the experience has been mind boggling and it has come to a kind of a conclusion where the modes of ticketing that we have employed, the kind of stations that we have are no longer the solutions for the future. Now, what Shramik threw to the railways was a period of uncertainty because from the 24th of March, there was a complete lockdown and suddenly on the 1st of May, we were asked giving less than 12 hours of preparation to start running shramic specials. And on a particular date, which is the 26th or the 27th of May, on that day, we have run 80 shramic specials only from Bombay VT station, which, which has put us under a tremendous kind of pressure. Now, how the shramics have operated? The state government used to come up with a list of people having a clearance, a medical clearance, they used to have an Aadhaar card. Those were got into sanitized buses. And once, once they reached our station, they were meant to go through thermal screening. And then tickets were given to each one of them, and they were meant to board the train. The second part was taken care of by the railways. The first part was done by the state authorities. But unfortunately, because of the uncertainty of the times, there was a lack of planning. So lack of planning resulted in haphazard timings for the trains, resulting in bunching of the trains at various locations, various stations, since most of the migrants were traveling from the major metropolitan cities to the states of UP and Bihar. So out of the 840 shramiks that we have run, 50% has gone to UP, 25% to Bihar, and about 6% to West Bengal. Getting clearances from the destination stations was a problem. Getting the and then on to top of it, we had the Ministry of Home Affairs, which kept on changing its rules for implementation. So first, the trains were traveling from one end to another with no boarding in between. And then suddenly the 500 kilometer rule came. And then after that, you could carry the, the train was going to two destinations. So making the list of the passengers, providing them with the services came as a challenge to the railways. Lack of list availability, no opportunity of communication with the destination station. 
no clearances given by the state government no one nodal officer to whom we could talk and sort out issues everybody was groping in the dark come on to the railway side the challenge of providing a rake all coach availability had to be managed you can imagine that if 80 trains are leaving one station what about the other stations on western railway also where trains were departing at the same speed these challenges which were thrown up to us made us realize that the traditional system of ticketing that we have been following cannot continue of course it's a paradox that we are talking about smart cities and governance where we had to evacuate a whole slum which is dharavi in a matter of one day which was the 26th and the 27th of may and how this evacuation was planned without informing the railway authorities also was a challenge no matter what the limitations which were present there and suddenly a change in policy that earlier the migrants were paying for the tickets and then the governments came to play a role now here what what anandor has mentioned and uh, and vivek ji too they have come up with a common mobility card concept a common mobility card concept is a thought process which has been with the railways for the last 3 years mumbai metropolitan development authority has come up with the concept of integrated ticketing which is yet to be implemented the uh, the in fact tenders had been given out and price waterhouse was involved in that process but somehow the tenders couldn't be finalized because railways could not come up with a definite plan now if you look at mumbai railways we are not only talking about main line trains traveling from one state to another we are also looking at the suburban system now suburban system in mumbai is the largest suburban system of the world carrying about 80 lakh passengers a day if you talk about technology we have already made a uts app mobile available for the use of suburban passengers which has been there for the last 4 to 5 years but unfortunately the number of users in these 5 years has reached a maximum of about say a lakh per day so not even a 0.5% of the population is actually using this app the app is very passenger friendly it has got a railway wallet but you can do internet banking on it too now what is it that prevents people from using the uts app mobile now like vivek ji had said that you know the socio economic standards of the people affect the kind of transport that they are going to use and what is the concept of mobility for them so if you look at the suburban system 80% of my passengers are those who are traveling to their offices on a daily basis so they are season ticket holders now season ticket holders you have monthly quarterly six monthly and yearly passes which are available now if these can be converted permanently and this needs to be like a policy decision so technology with a government decision of shifting all passengers to a kind of a mobility card which then gets recharged once a year maybe twice a year but then that kind of money availability has to be given by the employee to the employers who are traveling on a regular basis if this kind of money is made available to the passenger then 80% of my passengers will automatically shift to a mobile app which will make it very convenient for them not to come to the booking offices why does this become very important because we have now a post covid 19 we cannot have that footfall which we were expecting and were able to manage earlier like for example at a station like church gate we have about 14 to 15 like passengers during the course of a day in uh, at peak time vt you have about 24 lakh passengers a day during the course of a peak time now is that the kind of crowd that we really want to manage and the answer of course is a big no now what we need is we need flap kind of barricades people tapping in people tapping out the mobility card which vivek ji has talked about and even anand has mentioned that card can be a top up card also because there is there has to be a stream of accounts management for the people who are using it 
we all know that the socio-economic conditions of our passengers make them liable to cheat the system. And let's just face it, no matter how technologically advanced we become, there is always a loophole and a scope to do this kind of stuff. Like we were not aware, but season tickets were being replicated and duplicated in the present system also, where it is being issued by a computerized system. So one, we need a mobility, common mobility app for which is already in existence, but we need to popularize it through means of communication. The second part is the integrated mobile card, which is going to come, which is going to be an MCMC card issued by the government of India, and which can be extended as a means of transport for seamless travel between suburban, the best services, which are the bus services, which is being provided by the MMRDA. And then we have, of course, the metro system, which is also coming up in the city. And then we have waterways also. So we have the Sagar Setu also coming up, coming up. So if you come to Mumbai now, the marine drive is all drilled up, ready to take uh, uh, these small ships which will enter the marine drive area, bringing people from the suburban area to the to South Mumbai, where most of the big offices have been located. Having said these two things, we need another systemic change, which is that we have a vast data of the passengers who are coming to the railways. I don't think that any other government organization can have the amount of data we have in terms of passengers, their socioeconomic profile, their demographic status, and of course their work profile. With that kind of data, we can do a demarcation of the kind of service which the private operators will be willing to provide the passengers. It's not necessary that when we integrate, then railway has to be the focus of transport. In fact, it, contrary to this, we need to have a system where we devolute the number of passengers which are traditionally coming to the railways. So that requires a kind of a behavioral change. And now it has started because we are running a very limited amount of service and the state governments have started using a QR code system for the identification of the passengers. This brings me to the main part of change that we are introducing now on Central Railway, where all tickets are going to carry a QR code. The QR code will help us in checking a ticket from a distance. So we are going to maintain a social distance. The passenger can board the train. His details are with us. We can always find out from which, which part of the city to which part of the city the passenger is moving. Along with this, we are also going to be using the OCR technology. In the OCR technology, we are going to be using an opti optical app, which is going to read the details of the main line tickets. Again, there will be no passenger to passenger interaction. We are making our stations post COVID-19 more friendly while maintaining social distance by providing with kiosks. And this has happened at a number of stations and this is going to multiply where you can get your mask, your sanitizers, as well as your bedding, which you don't have to use and take from the railways at all. And which will dispense away with reuse of these beddings, which was again a very big health hazard and was normally going on for a very long time on the Indian railway system. Now, these kiosks are going to be automatically manned. They, we are also going to provide with thermal screening, which are going to be, again, an automatic system. So the need of the hour is that from a very manual intensive system of working, we are going to now shift towards a more technologically advanced ticketing system, journey experience, checking system also. Now let us come to the food part of it. For the shramiks, we have dispensed about 23 lakh meals on Central Railway alone, but it has not got us a very good, uh, good feedback. Reason being, first the state governments were responsible for the first 12 hours of the journey, and later on it came to be in the railway's hand. So we started distributing water and PAD items, but it has now made us realize that in the long run, we cannot have those open food items which were readily available at railway stations. And so a policy needs to be put in place where only PAD items will be sold, where passengers have to make good 
that you are going to start a journey of say 24 hours so your availability is going to be all water and packaged food which will be available through a kiosk in all trains these are the future developments that we are looking forward i think that should be all that i want to speak about thank you so much for uh, listening to what we are doing in the present system and although railway does need a lot of change and we are going in for solar panels and bringing in all that electric changes that we have to make and by 2030 we are saying that our carbon emissions are going to be zero we are going to use solar energy and we are going to use wind energy but that requires a lot of investment so i don't know where the money is going to come from but we have made a start uh, thank you madam uh, your your key uh, take away point which, which i have just you know assimilated it's like you are brought in the social economic aspect of the users and and systemic change with incoming data and railway has to be the focus of transport and your your post covid plan which railway is, is, has planned for, for providing a, a very seamless travel infrastructure or or accessibility to the users uh, in, in, in in the Indian context where we cannot even imagine the kind of people you are you have moved during this uh, COVID period. I mean the city is on. Uh, but but that five thousand kilometers express is truly really appreciated and recognized airport meant as a railway. And now I'd like to call upon uh, Madam Nikita Power to, to share uh, insights about this topic uh, or or the health department which uh, like transport department or under Nikola Adam. Over Thank to you, you Madam. Thank you, sir. Uh, I would like to speak on two components, uh, two kind of initiatives that we have introduced in Andaman and Nicobar. One is to make the uh, daily transit and daily commute more comfortable and more uh, approachable. The second component is the green mode. I'll first speak about how we have tried to make the uh, daily commute more comfortable for our uh, passengers. The first thing that we have done is we have introduced many AC shuttle buses, which act not only as a more comfortable mode of transportation, but they also act as last mile connectivity for our passengers because uh, in the congested and small roads where our medium and big buses cannot go. These act as a lifeline for those people as end-to-end -end mile connectivity. These buses have been very popular with our commuters and uh, there is demand for more and more. Presently, we have 22 such buses running in Fort Blair and uh, Swaraj Street. And our commuters are constantly demanding for more. So we'll be using more such buses in the future. These buses are equipped with uh, GPS-based vehicle location tracking systems, panic button passenger information systems. So uh, these are high on the uh, technology component. Apart from this, we are uh, when we talk about GPS-based uh, uh, vehicle location tracking system, we have also made it mandatory for all our uh, buses here, all the public transportation buses, both private and public. And we are taking initiative from the STS first to make 100% of our buses GPS equipped. And in the second phase, we are going for the private buses. Apart from this, uh, one big thing that we have done, we have initiated is that we are introducing 40 AC electric buses. 20 of them, uh, we have an agreement with NTPC directly from our department. And 20 of them, we are procuring under the smart city project that has been started for uh, our Portland city. And again, these buses will also have the same features such as panic buttons, passenger information system, and uh, GPS-based monitoring. Apart from this, we are also working on developing uh, uh, user-friendly bus kiosks, bus stops, come kiosks, where we are providing drinking water facilities, we are providing small eateries, mobile charging points, so basically, we are trying to make the waiting time that passengers have to spend at the bus stops uh, uh, easier for them, more comfortable for them. So we have plans uh, to construct these uh, smart bus queue shelters. 24 are going to be constructed hopefully by the end of this year. And uh, 55 plus more such bus stops are coming up uh, after that. 
Apart from that, we are also working on an integrated ticketing system where the commuters have the uh, facility for purchasing common tickets for end-to-end -end connectivity where they can let's avail a bus service, then go on to a boat or ship and then get to their destination and destination on a single integrated ticket. Bus port facilities are also to be introduced under the smart city project, which will also uh, uh, help us in a big way because uh, presently there is no bus port facility available here in Kublai. Then uh, I would like to speak at length about the uh, green mobility initiatives that we have started here over the last year and a half. Uh, first is we have uh, trained our electric vehicle policy, wherein we have provided a lot of in initial support and a lot of exemptions for people who want to switch from diesel and petrol based vehicles onto these electric uh, vehicles. And our draft EV policy is at the stakeholder consultation stage and uh, hopefully very soon we will uh, notify the policy. Under this policy, we have provided all kinds of exemptions for electric vehicles, such as waiver of parking charges, such as exemption of road tax, and many other such benefits we are giving so that people are uh, motivated and they move towards this uh, green mobility segment. Apart from this, uh, the first thing that we have done is uh, we have started introducing electric cars. Uh, you won't believe most of our senior officers, secretary level, commissioner level, are using these electric cars. And this is a way of not only leading from the front, but also of making people comfortable with the idea of electric cars. Because generally, uh, general public has all kinds of apprehensions. So presently, 72 e-cars have been introduced uh, in various departments and in the uh, secretariat for officers as well as other department employees. So these cars we are successfully operating and uh, we have proper charging infrastructure for these cars. We are also working at in future augmenting our charging infra and we are in touch with the power ministry for that. Like I already spoke, we are in the process of having 40 AC electric buses introduced here. And uh, once we have these 40 buses, I think a major chunk of our mobility will be in terms of e-mobility, especially the public transportation segment. Then uh, uh, our aim is not only to restrict it to public uh, uh, transportation segment, we are moving towards segment-wide uh, introduction of e-mobility. So we have introduced electric autos, we have introduced electric two-wheelers, uh, we have also experimented with the e-rickshaws. Uh, all this we have been doing. And uh, one way of promoting e-mobility, especially in two-wheeler segment, what we have done is we have made the uh, electric cars, uh, electric two-wheelers mandatory for uh, our rent-a-bike scheme. That is this uh, rent-a-bike scheme where the, it is especially for the tourists. They can rent a bike or a scooty and, you know, go around the city. And it is very popular, especially in islands like Swaraj Deep and Shahid Deep which are our key uh, tourism uh, oriented segments. So there we have made it mandatory that any commercial vehicle has to be uh, e-vehicle in these islands, Varaj Sweep and Shahid Deep. Further, under the rent a motorcycle or rent a bike scheme, all two wheelers have to be e-bikes or e scooters from uh, going ahead. So that is one big leap that we have taken and we hope to uh, uh, reduce the uh, diesel and petrol footprint of our day-to-day -day mobility, not only for the uh, general public of uh, uh, Andamans, but also for the tourists. And uh, apart from that, we are also, uh, uh, like I spoke, we are also working on augmenting the infrastructure for charging of these. Hello, am I audible? This is your audio. Yes. So, uh, like I said, we are also simultaneously working on on enhancing the infrastructure facilities, which is, I think, one of the biggest uh, challenges when large scale e mobility is introduced in the islands. So, that is something that we are working on along with Ministry of Power and Ministry of Heavy Industries to set up these charging infra. And uh, as far as e cars are concerned, we have, like I spoke, about 72 e cars. We are further enhancing the share of e-mobility uh, vehicles in our uh, uh, government fleet and uh, we expect 
to in the next five years replace all vehicles for the officers and the departments to be uh, uh, replace petrol and diesel based vehicles and bring in e cars so those are some of the initiatives that we are taking and uh, we are very hopeful that uh, uh, had this uh, corona COVID-19 outbreak had not happened, some of them would have started bearing fruit by now. But hopefully by the end of this year, we will be uh, having uh, good results and we will be seeing a lot of de-dieselization happening, not only uh, as an initiative of the department, but also within the general public. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam, for your, for your presentation, for your information which you have provided. Uh, your key points, actually, uh, it was very interesting to know that, you know, all the entire initiatives of the government and from your end is to mobility initiatives. And even if it is further required to know that, you know, most of the public servants up to the rank of the city commissioners, they are using the e which is very really interesting and new, new thing to know about the Indian, the Indian uh, government setup. And, and another important aspect was the um, last month connectivity also because we all we all in the Indian support, you know all these platform I and mean, traffic and platform we talk about the last month connectivity we also take the impact of the you know Virushiva and other DCRT uh, projects. Uh, we'll be more interested you know, in, in future regarding you know the south of the last month connectivity. Uh, with the future uh, into the conversation level first. And some of us would also like to know actually how these are everything your initiative is integrated to IPNS or whether it's centralized or whether it's decentralized, whether it's, there are the pilots there. So maybe if we get more time at the end of this course, we'll be we'd like to hear from you more. Now, now I'd like to uh, follow up on Mr. Chetan Nandani as I can see uh, about about his input regarding this uh, topic. Hello, uh, can, you, can you hear me? Mr. Chetan? Hello? Mr. Chetan? I think so. Chetanji is not being able to hear us. Now I can. Can you hear? Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah, now. <laughs> sorry, Mr. Me, sorry. Uh, good afternoon, uh, seniors. Uh, good afternoon, uh, dear colleagues. Uh, Rajput is a smart city since last two years. Uh, during a smart city consultation process, when we were uh, preparing the smart city plan, uh, two things emerged in the city. One was uh, scarcity of water, and uh, another thing was. Uh, heavy congestion in traffic. Uh, so we plan to address the water issue through Amrut scheme and uh, traffic uh, through Smart City. So under Pan City, we have included ITMS. Uh, this is, we assume, is one of the very important uh, outcome-based project. Uh, at present, we have installed about 25 signals in the city and uh, they have been made operational and uh, they have been uh, put in learning phase. Uh, what we have been uh, told is uh, the machines will need six months to learn the traffic patterns uh, uh, that during the part of the day when there is a dense traffic, when there is lesser traffic. And probably after six months, the signals will start operating on their own. Uh, along with that, we have put uh, additional uh, uh, access control systems uh, for our uh, BRTS bus stops. We have also put uh, public information systems on our BRTS uh, bus stops. We have put even uh, public addresses systems on our BRTS bus stops. Uh, a point I like to add, uh, though it is out of context, is uh, people are talking of uh, transit-oriented development. Probably Rajkot, we have really done it. Uh, we have a small stretch of 35 kilometer uh, BRTS, but out of that we have, till now we have uh, incurred 
more than 500 crore of FSI income uh, over the course of six to seven years. So this is uh, something which we have already done. Uh, regarding ITMS, uh, probably uh, I think once we the machine learning is over, probably we'll get the data. And probably out of that data, probably we'll be able to plan the traffic of the city in a better way. And this is a joint project between Rajkot Municipal Corporation and Rajkot City Police. So even the ICCC is shared by both Municipal Corporation and the City Police. I'm done, sir. I'm done, sir. I'm done, sir. No. Thank you, Mr. Chetan. It, it, it's great to know that you know you already have this uh, ITMS system is in the place and you're in the process of actually uh, aggregating data and come up with the, with the more robust solution after once you, you, you have the data and, and process it. So, uh, we'd like to know more about your PRTR and, and the writer seat, whether it's increasing over the period of time and what kind of uh, you know the kind of people they are accessing the the DRTS system, and or or its penetration within the city, or how much is, is uh, what kind of population is getting to. Maybe at the end of the session, if we get more time, we will we'll see we'll do that. Yes, sir. So now I have to, uh, I'd like to pass on to Mr. Mubarak um, then from JNK, uh, and please Mubarak. Uh, Thank you, sir. A very good afternoon to all senior officers and management of GSCC who have given me a chance to speak on the issue. Uh, you know, Srinagar has a different topography uh, and uh, we have hilly terrains. So my point is very clear regarding transport is mm, we have to do travel demand estimation first. I don't think Srinagar has done a clear cut travel demand estimation till date. So uh, we did a little bit of survey last year, wherein we found that 80% of the commuters still use public transport. We have almost, in Srinagar city, we have almost 1,60,000 seats available per day for uh, city operations, having a different uh, mix, uh, service mix. But uh, actual demand is more than that. So it leads to overloading and most of the times it leads to accidents. That's my number one point to strengthen public transport. We have a very good organization, JK, SRTC, STU, who have worked since decades. Uh, I think they are the backbone of development in our state. So for uh, uh, now, as of now, they are running 20 electric buses. Uh, and I request by uh, way of this medium, that SRTC should be given a chance to strengthen public transport by strengthening their depots in all uh, nook and corner of the state, as it was like 30 years before, uh, number one. Number two, the man behind the wheel. I usually focus on the man behind the wheel driver. We, uh, we have not done too much to appreciate the work of a driver that he has done for our country or as a state or as a UT. So, uh, as a smart city project, uh, I would uh, request that uh, something for the driver, the man behind the wheel should be done and regular trainings and encouragement should be there. Number two. Number three, uh, walkability index. I don't think we have conducted walkability index of cities. So, we, as a smart city Srinagar project, we have improved almost 20, 25 kilometers of pedestrian walkways. Uh, we are blessed with waterways. It would be nice. We are working on that project, waterways, waterways, uh, inland transport, which had been uh, lastly uh, uh, one of the components of the transport. Now uh, we are witnessing urbanization, and due to urbanization, we are uh, witnessing huge influx of people coming to the urban areas for want of job. So that creates a chaos. There is no uh, clarity in that as to how we tackle that. There is effective land policy should be there. Uh, well, I'd like to add here that every intervention which we do in this project should be research-based. That's my request. It should be research-based. Suppose we are making flyover. We have to think, is there a research policy? Is there a clear research that we are making 
flyovers or we intend to make more flyovers for a place which has a topography like Srinagar. Uh, this is my request. Number two, uh, I would love, uh, like that uh, cycling as, a, as an option of NMT, non-motorized transport, should be encouraged. During these pandemic days, I have witnessed there is a huge growth in number of cyclists who cycle in the morning and evening. So uh, even I wrote a little bit of an article on it that is coronavirus an opportunity for us to or for the urban planners to revisit their decisions. Uh, that's I want to put like this. We are doing good as a smart city project. I hope that uh, Srinagar would come as a beautiful smart city with its culture and heritage put in place. We should, uh, we should not be demolished of, uh, on the cost of Sri, uh, smart city project. We are doing good, sir. Uh, just these two, three things that we intend to improve public transportation. Number of buses should increase. Uh, I believe that uh, one of the research papers I have read is that almost 30% of the given population, we should have seats available. We don't have metro as of now. Uh, that is one of the projects that would come up. And uh, inshallah, it would be a boon for the Srinagar. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Mubarak Singh. Uh, your the uh, the first thing as emerged from your you know, from this discourse was basically you have highlighted the importance of the of the research research based uh, yes sir uh, decision making uh, while well finalizing the project or or both in first place. Where it's right. very important for us to understand that you know uh, your city must have a, a mobility plan with which right, out of the you know. Of, of, of the rigorous uh, the survey uh, method, like you, you do origin destination survey, travel demand survey, model split, and intersection, uh, what we call intersection analysis. Uh, those those kind of aspects needs to be there, then only we'll be able to create a infrastructure which is suitable for the city. So coming back to the point, so if if we have uh, some more time, then maybe we can just have a uh, relook upon the this this course. And and I like to put forth some of the actually I'm a little bit inclusive of some of the aspect which which is put forth by the with the panelists uh, like especially uh, I mean uh, I think so we have got uh, ten more minutes uh, left Navin Rai ji so so uh, uh, if uh, anyone has, has would like to uh, uh, cross question or, or or like to get some insights from the panelists they can do so Other, otherwise i can i can take it over or find and support your your uh no i don't think so we have got any questions uh, at present so it's like i think so you can conclude then i'll uh, speak at last okay so anyway uh, like uh, from this discourse i'm actually very very uh, it, it was very insightful for me, actually, after sitting in, in, in you know, lockdown in my place for a very long period, and uh, especially in this in this context of you know transportation of, or mobility, so there is always uh, the, I'm a little bit apprehensive about the fact that you know when India was to talk about you know the metro, uh, but I would suggest that you need to look uh, into the city context whether you really require a metro or not, because considering your uh, fragility of the ecosystem, domain pathways, uh, you know, the, the location. So I would suggest that, you know, please have a look at this just because all the cities are adopting the metro systems because there is a project or there is a plan on the ministry as well. Uh, on the high side, but but this metro, if it is required, then it is one of the most efficient systems, travel, you know, infrastructure, transfer infrastructure I've seen all across the world, like DFL. Uh, or underground in London and and the Brisbane, all, almost all of the Europe, they have a very very different transport system, which is, you know, what we call like even Lisbon, like simple tram system is very very effective. Whereas unluckily we have ignored the transport tram system of the Kolkata, which is actually very very you know efficient, so it's slow. Uh, at the same time, now I like to get some kind of you know what we call uh, information, if possible, from Madam Nikita Power. Actually, uh, how how are you managing? You know the the uh, what is it? Poor uh, in uh, smartness or or architecture or or uh, automation part of your you know what is it? The system which you are putting in place like uh, travel bus, AC travel bus, where it's fitted with the GPS or panic button. So whether it's a, it's a centralized uh, center where everybody everything is monitored or 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 it is in in silos. 
so uh, presently one of the major challenges that we face here in andamans is the issue of internet connectivity so uh, presently we do not have a centralized system or 24/7 monitoring of the uh, tracking devices but uh, because right now we are at a point where the internet services have started improving and in fact in last couple of months they have improved a lot as compared to previously so now eventually as and when we have improved the monitoring system and uh, it will be under the smart city project because in the smart city project we are having a, a common monitoring system for all kind of so uh, from the transport side we are not having a separate system as of now but in the smart city project that can be there so presently uh, why we are introducing gps and all those things right now is so that once the internet services are sufficient and the uh, architecture for the smart city comes in place then we should be ready with all the other uh, technological uh, and technical aspects so that is what uh, our approach is sir so right now we are not having the centralized monitoring system but we are moving in that direction okay thank you and and uh, the last question actually is there any policy formulated by by the administration regarding you know incentivizing the uh, the vehicle charging stations or or any any subsidy in the power which will be consumed by the you know when you uh, e e car so presently uh, the power charging stations are being set up in uh, in uh, support with the ministry of power and eesl so they are doing it right now so we have not really privatized that segment because we do not have that much demand but once the uh, number of vehicles increase and general public starts moving towards e cars and e uh, two wheelers then we will be uh, moving in this direction sir and we will definitely be in, in uh, including uh, relevant provisions in our vehicle policy so there we have kept provisions for providing power at a, a, a low price as well as providing other exemptions such as easy availability of land and uh, other uh, issues that are there so that we have included in our policy but we are not at a stage where we are really looking at entrepreneurs coming ahead at setting up charging stations yet thank you ma'am now i think fine uh, this is all i have i mean uh, today i like to thank all the panelists PPC. okay carry on carry on so presently like i said that ntpc is presently doing at nine places and uh, minister power and dsl are there and dhi is also there so they are doing it it is government driven right now so entrepreneur driven it will be perhaps at a later stage uh, thank you madam thank you madam uh, good to know that maybe we'll be able to see more uh, coming out from your 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 administration and maybe someday when i think it over we'll be able to visit your place and actually i'm more you know interested and i'm more into our more into immobility uh, this is my personal way however it may be different from others and i think uh fine if we allow then we may conclude this session uh, uh sure so uh, i would i would like to add a few words before we end so uh, actually it was a very diversified uh, panel if you see we have got uh, uh, two representative from smart city uh, navin ji and uh, chetan ji then we have got two representatives from the transport department nitika ji and mubashir jan ji then we have the consultant in uh, in the form of vivek okra ji we have got an industry representative in them then uh, from railway iti pande ji so um it's like the kind of uh, talk the kind of knowledge which was uh, shared during this panel was quite uh, immense and learning for everyone and uh, um it's like i'd like to commend uh, nitika pawar ji also because last uh, year in november we did an we did an event smart cities conclave in port blair and ma'am was one of the speaker there with the kind of challenges uh, andaman faces as an administration and the way they uh, function is like quite commendable because there is a huge uh, because it's an island uh, island uh, this thing uh, city so but uh, the problem is like uh, the it's like the challenges which they face and the way they overcome those challenges and the way they are like working into it it's like um, it's like I, i was present in the in um, like i was present in uh, port blair for almost a month with my team to uh, organize this conclave 
so it was quite uh, quite uh, impactful and quite um, it's like uh, learning for everyone and the way etg talked about the railways the roles and the uh, migrants issues so that's also something it's like uh, we, we should uh, um, it's like applause the way the railways had handled uh, this situation and same way uh, how rajkot has worked towards it then um, it's like i i and indo gave a good uh, presentation about mobility very brought in the global perspective and it's like it was quite interesting and also i would like to thank my team uh, basically we are just four, four of us raman mishra he was like uh, uh, he he brought all these speakers so we had almost on 40 plus uh, speakers from across the sector so raman kumar mishra is my uh, government alliance person then we have got farhan khan so he was like he was the man behind all this uh, technology behind the technical the, so there is no technically uh, technical uh, technology glitch and everything should run smooth then another colleague rashid and uh, myself so basically uh, we four of us had pulled up this two days conclave and i would really like to thank you everyone to spare your time and to be a part of this uh, uh, interesting platform and you have uh, made mr like you have created a value for us and we are honored to have you all here thank you thank you thank you so much thank you thank you thank you bye bye thank you everyone thank you